Amen. Is it well with your soul this morning? Praise the Lord. It's uh, good to be together and join together in worship. Looking forward to this community, this time of worship, this fellowship, and looking into God's Word. Do you have any plans for the summer? Big plans, exciting things you're looking forward to doing? Yeah. Are you going to have good weather, Bogots? Okay, I know, that's a stupid question. How can you know what the future is? Well, you know, weather forecasters, they try to predict. It doesn't work so well, but, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good job. Uh, we, my, my niece, um, had a summer wedding, and she decided to have an outdoor wedding. And so you can kind of expect where that story is going. So it was a beautiful day. And she had a tent set out outside just in case something inclement would happen. And, and there was a, one small thunderstorm that was passing through. But they were watching and they were keeping track. We moved everything under the tent just to make it easier. And so the bride and her dad came riding in on a carriage behind a horse-drawn carriage. And right then, the storm dumped. That was an unexpected uh, wedding. Very memorable. Everybody remembers that wedding. <laughs> Bride looked different than how she had prepared. <laughs> That's, uh, we can't predict the future. Weather, uh, people, breakdowns, things. We have all manner of things that break or all kinds of things we, people, we wish... They would react this way. We can't expect, we don't know how they're going to react or uh, when they're going to be ready. Those uncertainties. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we put together a time capsule and we put in it uh, a bunch of predictions as to what we thought would be happening. Our son Andrew and Alexis were heading over to Tanzania and so we thought, oh, this will be fun. We'll. It'll be about two years before they get back. We'll put all these predictions in there and sign their name and see who gets the most accurate predictions at the end. You have to wait to the end of the sermon to find out what those predictions were. <laughs> we create expectations and predictions. Not everything goes as we would like it to. If it's a big thing... It's tempting to get angry with God. Why did you allow this to happen? Or maybe we try to manipulate the future. We take things into our own hands, try to control things in and of ourselves. Uh, birthday cards. You, you've got the birthday cards that say, Happy birthday, wish you have a great year with all of the blessings that you deserve and all this kind of thing. They sell. Uh, the ones that say, uh, happy birthday, at least you're not as old as next year, <laughs> they, they don't sell as well, unless you've got some person that you're really trying to get back at. God's Word gives us clear predictions of things for the future and things that we wish we knew but we do not fully understand. Some of those we can control. Some of those we have no control over at all. But we know that things are not always going to be as they always have been. We can put those expectations aside. This morning we're going to look at the end times. Just thought that I needed a little challenge for the summer, go into the lion's den and pet the kitties. We have lots of expectations, lots of predictions of what is going to happen. Sometimes we need to just set all of that aside and say, Lord, what can we know? What do you have to tell us? So we're going to do a two-part message here. This one is going to be what you can know. Next week is what you can't know. Really, God's and his word is the only thing that we have that is certain. God's word is our only certainty. 
So let's dig in here as we look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24, starting verse 3, and find out what can we know about this end times, the uncertain, the, the question that we would love to predict and understand. The disciples of Jesus had these same kind of questions that we do. Matthew 24, 3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray because lawlessness will be increased. The love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Oh, that's a great encouraging text as we start off the day here today. You read us something like that, and it can cause anxiety just reading it. You've got fears, questions, and doubts that rise up as you look at something like that. What can we know? What can we be confident of? End times is a popular topic because we can see things that are happening, world events, situations. Uh, Trevor Rubenstein talked about last week that there's this surge of Jews that are coming to faith in Christ. What about these signs and wonders that are around us? What can we know? What can we know for certain? Well, let's look. Beginning in verse 1, you can know that Jesus will come. Verse 3. Tell us then, when these things, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them. You can know what's happening because Jesus will come. This text just gives a hint of that. There's lots of scriptures that give a lot more detail. One of those is John 14, where Jesus tells his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Similar theme there. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. You know, for us, as well as for the disciples, we want more answers. We want to know the when, the where, the how, the what Jesus' uh, disciples, Thomas, he asked, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How are we going to know uh, the way? Or Philip. Philip said, Lord, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough. Well, Jesus didn't answer the questions as they expected or wanted. But he did say, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He also said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. The promise is there. 
both that he will come and that he will be with us even while we wait. So maybe the question really isn't about what are the events surrounding Jesus coming. Maybe the question really is, will he come before I die? This week I was talking to a friend who had lost a classmate. And he said, when somebody that is your age dies, it makes you think a lot more about the end. Understandable. Maybe the question really isn't either of those. It's not about when Jesus comes or how he comes or the events and all that surrounding or, or even when we die. Maybe the real question is, how are we going to live? Because we know he's coming. His word is very clear about that. And we know that if he doesn't come, we will die. So then the question remains, how are you going to live today if you knew you were going to die tomorrow? Or how are you going to live today if Jesus was coming back tomorrow? Ultimately, isn't that the point? Because we know he's coming Apart from his coming, we know we'll die. So how do we live? Second, you can know that God is in control. Verse 6, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not alarmed. Hmm. For this must take place. The end is not yet. Jumping to verse 8. All of these things are but the beginning of the birth pains. Don't be alarmed about the wars. We've been watching that play out in front of us, this whole Ukraine and Russia war, and we have been alarmed. We see what's going on. We know people that are affected by that, and we care. Or what about the, the tensions between China and Taiwan? It causes us concern. It, it will affect us. Don't be alarmed. Maybe the real challenge there is that uh, we feel out of control, and that's why we feel alarmed. And then we also just slide into that question about Well, if all of this is happening around us, is God really in control? We can wonder that. We can ask those questions. Is God really in control? Well, look at this list. Look at this list. Are we going to blame God for our own chaos? Who is leading the people astray? Is it the Lord? Who are the ones that are fighting the wars? Who is the one that's hoarding the food or causing the tribulation or the death? Who are the false prophets? Who are the lawless ones? Who are the ones whose love has grown cold? And we blame God for things that we cause. He is the one that is in control. He is the one that is in the fixing business from the very beginning. He's the one that has sent the prophets. He's the one that has sent deliverers. He's brought the people out of exile twice. He gave us his word. He sent us his son. He has been trying to build that relationship, keep that relationship from the beginning. He's in control, and we're fighting against him. Notice what it says there. See to it that you are not alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. Praise God that he is patient with us. Praise the Lord that he is the one that has the last word. How things turn out. 
what happens in our lives, what the future holds. Third, what can you know? You can know that it will get messy. Don't don't be alarmed. It's going to get worse. This text describes a mess. Wars, famine, tribulation, death, hatred. And you look around and you say, doesn't seem so different than what we're in the middle of. Why? Why is that? Because we are the messy ones. We are sinful, rebellious, selfish. We treat those who don't agree with us as enemies. We are quick to argue, slow to listen, slow to understand. Our world is messy because we are messy. But this is not the first time this has been messy. Oh, God creates Adam and Eve. They have two boys. The younger one kills the older one. Oh, put the human race at, in the existence of the human race in jeopardy. Or the time of Noah. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's messy. Or the judges, the people of Israel, the chosen, the people of God. They did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And they forgot the Lord their God and served Baals and Asherahs. We don't have to look at situations around us. We don't have to look at biblical history. We can look at our own lives. We can look in the mirror We can look at our families. It's messy. We can look at our own hearts. You know, it's funny that we expect the world to turn out better, to get better, but we are the ones causing the problems in the first place. How can it turn out better than ourselves? apart from God. So what do we do with all of this mess? What if our prayers were filled with repentance? What if we were admitting our sin, both to God and to one another? What if we had humble requests for forgiveness? Or what if our praises overflowed with gratitude for who God is, how great He is, all that He has provided for sending His Son, for the evidence of His work in people's lives? Isn't it a matter of what we focus on? Oh, the joy that could be filling our hearts, filling our lives, if we had lower expectations on people and a more praise to the Lord for what He has done, who He is. Fourth, what can you know? You can know that the gospel will be proclaimed. Verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. That's it. Now we know the end will come. Now what's this? <laughs> the purpose, the subject of the sentence is the gospel. We need to keep our focus on the gospel. That is where we are not left in despair. In despair. That's where we clarity comes and and the uncertainty is is swept away. It's in the gospel that we repair it is in the gospel that we prepare for Jesus' coming. It is in the gospel, the good news that he came into the world in the first place. 
And it's good news that he's coming again. It's the gospel that reminds us that God is in control. It's in the cross that we see him fixing the mess and the sinfulness of this world or those who are willing to give their lives to him. It's in the resurrection that we have both the promise and the evidence of eternal life. It's in the gospel where there is hope for messy sinners, messy lives. He's the one that made that relationship with him possible. Oh, the privilege of knowing what Jesus has done, the confidence we can have when we rest on him. And then what about this, the end will come? Or you might have to wait till next week for that answer. For now, we can be grateful for God's patience, his desire for all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, for providing a mediator. So in our time capsule, we opened it a year early, but it was interesting to see how many of the predictions had come true already at that point. Here's some of them. Uh, the Vikings would have a new coach again. Someone predicted they would lose weight. Not saying who that was, but it didn't work. <laughs> My daughter would get a dog. Close. Just about. Andrew would move back from Tanzania. I put a couple of other ones in there that a family mem member would have a health crisis. We had two. Um, predicted that somebody would die. And uh, that wasn't true. That didn't happen yet. There's many things that we do not know about the future, but maybe more important than knowing what is going to happen is keeping our focus on who is coming. You can be confident about the future because you know who is coming. That's where the hope is. That's where the confidence is. That's where God is. You know, I don't know where you're at today. There's a need to realign our lives with the Lord all the time. Maybe there's things that you're trying to, predictions, things of your life that you're trying to control, wishing you were there were a certain way. And you need to just give it back to God. Maybe there's people out here today, online, they're not trusting in the Lord. They haven't, they don't know the one who's coming. Today's the day. Don't wait. So as we take some time and just allow the Lord to speak to you personally and privately, let Him be the one who directs all of the things of your future. Let's pray. Lord God, there's a lot of things that we don't understand. But we do what we do understand gives us encouragement. Your promise is that you would come. And we know that is going to be true. That you're in control in spite of all of the things that we do to make a mess of this world and make a mess of our lives. And your gospel is the answer that we need every day. 
the work that you have done. Lord Jesus, I pray, even as we admit our inability to control what is in the future, control what is happening in our own lives, we admit our need for you. Take control. We give it to you. And Lord, for those who have not yet, I pray you would be speaking to their heart, putting that your uh, promises, your word deep into their heart, and causing them to see, say, yes, I want to know that one, the one who is coming. I am going to trust him with the mess of my life. And I'm going to believe, yes, Jesus, you were enough. I want to say yes to you. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.